Josh Haston here, Israel Uncensored, on the Land of Israel Network at thelandofisrael.com. Thanks so much for joining us. It is Sunday, July 8th, 2018, the 25th of Tammuz, 5778. I am here in Gush Etzion. Hope you're doing well in your part of the world. Get in touch with me during the week, Josh, at thelandofisrael.com. On Facebook, it is Joshua Haston on Twitter at Josh Haston. Now, a very special, very important law was passed in the Israeli parliament, the Knesset, this past week. Historic, historic law was passed. You might have heard of the Taylor Force Act in the United States of America, recently passed by both houses of Congress, I believe, in order to withhold funding from the Palestinian Authority as long as they continue on their program, which we call Pay to Slay. In other words, for years now, the Palestinian Authority has been funding terrorists who carry out murderous attacks against Israelis. The more Israelis you murder, the more money you get as a terrorist sitting in Israeli jail. And if you're killed, the more money your family gets. You're talking about uh, Arab residents of the PA who are becoming millionaires. Last year alone, the PA spent $360 million on this program. Uh, Several programs, but that's the total sum, uh, paying to slay. Now, if that's not incentive enough to carry out murderous attacks, um, I don't know what is, okay? And so that was the Taylor Force Act. This week in Israel, thanks to my next guest and a lot of others, Israel passed a similar law, a little bit different, but a similar law. The point being, if you are going to murder Israelis, then Israel will no longer tolerate this policy of pay to slay. Here to explain it all is Maurice Hirsch. He's been a guest on the show before. He's the ex-head of military prosecution for Judea and Samaria. He is currently the head of legal strategies at Palestinian Media Watch, an organization that I reference almost weekly on my program. Maurice, welcome back to the show. Hi, Josh, to you and to to listeners. So first of all, I want you to explain the new law passed in the Knesset in order to try to prevent the Palestinian Authority and their pay-to-slay program murdering Israelis. So as you explained previously, Josh, the Palestinian Authority pays somewhere in the region of 1.2 billion shekels a year, $360 million a year, in order to reward and incentivize terrorism. That's one figure. The other figure is that the Israelis and the Palestinians, as part of the Oslo Accords, agreed that Israel would collect different taxes on behalf of the Palestinian Authority and pass them over. So every month, Israel transfers somewhere between six to seven hundred million shekels to the Palestinian Authority. We know that some of that money is then used to pay the salaries to the terrorists to fund pay for slay. The new legislation says that any money that the Palestinian Authority pays to terrorists will be deducted from those tax revenues and will not be transferred over to the Palestinian Authority. Thereby, the Israeli government is saying, we will no longer take part in this program. It's something which is completely offensive. It's something where the Israeli government is really paying for the death of Israelis. Tell me, what was your role? I know you had a whole team of people who are trying to get this bill approved into law, and it did pass three readings in the Knesset. It is now a a law, as far as I understand. What was your role uh, in order to make this a reality? So Palestinian Media Watch really had two uh, uh, main roles within the process. Firstly, providing the factual background for the whole program. That was one section which, which Palestinian Media Watch has been dealing with since 2001. Um, so that was one part of the deal. The other part of the deal was taking into account specifically my uh, professional background, making sure that the law encompassed all of the terrorists who were receiving salaries. The initial law proposed by by M.K. Elazar Stern, only talked about salaries being paid to terrorists who had been tried and convicted in the Israeli courts. That's only about 4% of the terrorists in total. The rest are tried and prosecuted in the military courts, and had the bill gone through as it were, then they would have been left out. So that was specifically my contribution, making sure that the bill encompassed everyone that it needed to take into account and to make sure that all of the money was actually taken that is paid out. Now, what's your take on the um, those who say that the bill was watered down? Originally, 
there was the hope that the money which would be withheld from the Palestinian Authority would go to victims of terror. But it's my understanding that the bill doesn't, in fact, go to them, but it, it is put aside. Maybe one day it will happen that victims of terror will actually reap, uh, I mean, I, want to, I don't want to say the benefits because they've obviously gone through so much losing family members, but at least some of the money will go to them and to pay for the millions of things that they need, the therapies and, the, and everything that, God forbid, we shouldn't know of such things that terror victims need. Is there a chance that down the road, perhaps, uh, the terror victims will, in fact, receive these withheld funds. So in my position as the head of the prosecution for Jeddah and Samaria, I sat many times opposite the victims of terror and had to explain to them that even if they receive judgments from the military courts awarding them damages, there's almost no chance that they would see that money. How can you carry out that type of a judgment? The terrorist is in jail, in most instances for life sentences. Any property or assets that he has are in the Palestinian Authority, which obviously doesn't cooperate. And so really those judgments were empty of any ability to actually collect. So in, as part of the legisl legislative process, I suggested to the government that we then use the money that was then to be confiscated to compensate the victims who already have judgments against Palestinians. Um, initially, the government accepted that argument and put in a provision which said that money that had been confiscated would be used to compensate the, the victims. The government at the last minute really did get cold feet on that provision and decided to take it out for questionable legal reasons. Um, so now those victims are back in the same position where they are unable to collect any of their damages. And so now I'm working with a, a team of other lawyers to try and find a new provision and to suggest new legislation that will again use that money to compensate the victims or other money from the tax uh, revenue that Israel collects. At the same time, the Palestinian Authority is already saying, regardless of this judgment by the Israeli Knesset or this uh, new resolution or, or law, uh, they say, we'll find a way. We'll continue this pay for slave program. This isn't going to hurt us. It's not going to affect us. We'll find, I don't know, some European countries. Uh, in other words, they're, they're saying that they're talking a lot now about how they're going to continue, which they call funding the martyrs. That's how they describe these horrible uh, jihadists. They say that they'll keep paying them. Is there a way for them to get around this new law and, in fact, continue the program? Or do you believe this has made such a, a tremendous dent in their uh, system that they're going to be scrounging in order to keep this program running? So the dent has truly been made with a combination of the Taylor Force Act and the new Israeli legislation. They've obviously taken a serious financial hit. I unfortunately believe that the Europeans will pick up some of that slack. The Europeans refuse to accept that any money that they give to the Palestinian Authority is fungible. And any money that they give, even providing schools or hospitals to the Palestinian Authority, frees up revenue, other revenue, which the Palestinian Authority then uses to pay terrorists. So I think that the Europeans will step in. I think that they will possibly even suggest other ways to circumvent um, the new provisions. For example, by persuading the Palestinian Authority to call these payments welfare payments. Until now, they're clearly not welfare payments, but I'm sure the Europeans will have their hand in persuading the Palestinians. If you just change the title, then no one's going to object to welfare payments. Yeah, welfare payments when you have people who are becoming millionaires from murdering Israelis. So I obviously take uh, issue with that lie, which is being uh, perpetrated over and over by the Palestinian Authority. At the same time, the nation of Australia, the country of Australia, also stepped up uh, this week, this past week, from what I understand. And they also said, we had enough of this business of, of uh, giving money, just turning money blindly over to the Palestinian Authority, which may end up in the hands of the terrorists and their families. What's your take on the Australian uh, statement that they would stop also funding the PA as a result of their actions involved in terror? So part of the activities that no one really sees is the fact that the head of Palestinian Media Watch, Itamar Marcus, met just two and a half months ago with two groups of Australian legislators and presented them with our findings on the pay to slay. Um, an, Amer an Australian pressure group also cited PMW as the source for the pressure that they put on the Australian government um, 
to stop the payments. And now we've seen the fruit of all those actions. We hope that, 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 that those actions will be duplicated by the European authorities and the European governments. Um, it's a tremendous step forward. None of the donor countries are really interested in, in funding this program. And they just have to come to the realization that any funding they provide will be used by the Palestinians for this purpose. One last question. You and I were actually together in the Knesset last week at a special session about the Oslo Accords and the failure of the Oslo Accords. But in the room that day in the Knesset was Taylor Force's father. I believe his name was Stuart. He was here to see firsthand, to witness the vote in the Knesset. And he gave an emotional address uh, in front of those present MKs and other important uh, figures in that room, a lot of uh, yourself and other PMW officials and a lot of those who helped pass Israel's version, if you want to call it that, of the Taylor Force Act. What are your thoughts and feelings seeing this poor man at the Knesset, you know, despite everything that has happened to him, the loss of his son, uh, dying a hero, being murdered on the Tayelet there, the promenade in, in Tel Aviv, still coming to Israel and showing support and thanking the people of Israel for all they've done for him and his family despite such a tremendous loss. What, what were you thinking as he was speaking and in other conversations that I, I believe you've had with him since he's arrived in Israel? So Shua Force, from all the conversations we've had, is truly an incredible person that sees really the, 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 the depth of the of the disaster of this of this program, um, he sent his son, a an American war hero, a veteran, an officer in the army, on a trip to Israel. He's not an Israeli. He's not a settler. He's not one of the uh, uh, the people that are constantly demonized. And he only then did he really understand what is terrorism, what is Palestinian terrorism. Palestinian terrorism means that you kill anyone anywhere simply because you don't like who they are. It doesn't have to be an Israeli. That's terrorism. It doesn't matter who the target is. You achieve your goal. And I think Stuart truly understood that and was determined to do everything in his capability to make sure that that program would be stopped in the understanding that it had truly incentivized the, the murder of Taylor. So I didn't get the opportunity to meet him that day in the Knesset. I actually met him the, the following night, I believe, at the uh, U.S. official 4th of July party here in Israel with Ambassador David Freeman. But Taylor Force's father, Stuart, was at the event, and I had an opportunity to introduce myself and say hello to him and meet him and, and speak to him for a few minutes one-on-one. -on -one. And it was an extremely humbling experience to be even in his presence. I mean, unfortunately, over the years, I've interviewed on my show and other shows I've had in the past so many victims of terror and their families and have, and have written about them. And uh, I felt you know, so small compared to this humble, uh, wonderful, gentle person who recognizes the difference between right and wrong, who had this horrible tragedy uh, uh, befell him and his family. But it, it was really, really a humbling experience to meet him, and it is one that I will not forget uh, anytime soon. But I want to congratulate you, Maurice Hirsch, head of legal strategies at PMW, for passing this historic bill into law in the Israeli parliament, in the Israeli Knesset. Enough of this pay to slay. No more transferring funds to the Palestinian Authority that are going to be used to pay the terrorists and their families. I want to thank you for everything that you do. Thanks, Josh. And um, that is, um, I, I don't know, I'm still moved, honestly. I'm just thinking about meeting uh, Stuart Force's father there uh, just last week. A historic week here in Israel. Thanks to Maurice Hirsch, PMW, and everyone else who had a hand. There was a group photo I saw you guys took there in the Knesset. All those who had a hand in passing this historic legislation. Let's hope we hear many more good things, and let's get the terrorists, let's hit them where it hurts in their, uh, in their bank accounts. That's where it starts. Uh, we're going to take a break right now and come back with everything going on in the news. My name is Josh Haston. This is Israel Uncensored on the Land of Israel Network at thelandofisrael.com. Hope you're doing well in your part of the world. Get in touch with me during the week. Josh at thelandofisrael.com the is my email. I love your emails. Keep sending me emails. I'd love to read them. Happy to respond. I'd love to read your emails on the air if I get your permission to do so. I appreciate each and every one. On Facebook, it's Joshua. Haston and on Twitter at Josh Haston. We'll take a short break. Be right back with much, much more here on Israel Uncensored. Don't go away.
every time there was an offer for the Palestinians and they said no, they were rewarded. The negotiations weren't working. Is conflict over when one side declares victory or the other side declares defeat? Hopefully you'll get the answers on today's rejuvenation with me, Eve Harrow, on the Land of Israel Network as I bring you the recordings from the Victory Caucus in the Knesset in Jerusalem from just a few days ago. Rejuvenation with Eve Harrow at thelandofisrael.com. And we are back. Josh Haston here. Israel Uncensored on the Land of Israel Network at thelandofisrael.com. It is Sunday, the 8th of July, 2018, the 25th of Tammuz, 5778. You can get in touch with me during the week, Josh at thelandofisrael.com. On Facebook, it's Joshua Haston, and on Twitter, at Josh Haston. Let's get to some news here as we wrap up the show for today. According to the Jerusalem Post, the High Court in Israel has temporarily suspended the raising of the illegal Bedouin village of Khan Alamar. The illegal Palestinian Bedouin herding village received a last-minute reprieve over the weekend, according to the J Post, when the High Court of Justice issued a temporary injunction just as the IDF had begun preparations for its demolition. Um, the United Nations, of course, and the European Union had appealed to the Israeli government to halt the destruction of the village located just off Route 1 near Kfar Adumim. Now, let me explain to you just a little bit of the background on this illegal village. This is a Bedouin village. I don't even know if you want to call it a village. It's a, it's a grouping of a cluster of homes and a school there just on the left side of the road if you're driving from Jerusalem to the Dead Sea. And what these people are, they are pawns. They are pawns put there by the Palestinian Authority. This is part of the Fayyad plan, who was the Palestinian Authority prime minister. Back in 2009, Fayyad came out with this plan about Palestinian Authority taking over strategic areas in Area C, which is under full Israeli control, under full uh, violation of the Oslo Accords, even though the Oslo doesn't really exist these days. Nevertheless, the plan was to take over these strategic areas. So they put up this makeshift village there. The organization Regavim has aerial photos of the area. There was never a village there. They have no history to this area. And they constructed this illegally. And the plan is we'll put these strategic villages on the map. And then once Israel and the PA go back to so-called peace talks, there will be facts on the ground. And the Palestinian Authority will say, well, this needs to be part of our areas because it's already there. So what did Israel do? Israel came to the village and said, we will build for you a new neighborhood nearby. We'll hook you up to the water system. We'll give you um, electricity. We'll integrate you into society. Israel offered these people four different neighborhoods to move to. Instead, the Palestinian authorities holding the residents of Khan al-Amar essentially hostage, using them as political pawns. And it is a dangerous situation for them because you have little kids literally running across Highway 1. I've seen it for myself. I've been there. On the other hand, you have some residents of this community who are throwing rocks and have been caught throwing rocks down at motorists below. So it's a terrible situation for Israel. But it looks like Israel has caved and will not destroy this illegal village, which is on Israel state land. And I would bet you, if you got a real answer from the residents there, they would rather move to a permanent, beautiful neighborhood in a community nearby instead of being political pawns for the Palestinian Authority. But notice, though, how the UN Security Council and Human Rights Council and the British Parliament, every, everyone else speaks up when it comes to Khan al -Amar, this little tiny village off Highway 1, yet... They're quiet on Syria, they're quiet on Iran, Yemen, and all these countries where real atrocities are taking place, the European Union and the UN, don't do anything about. When it comes to Israel trying to uphold the law, that's when they speak up. Unfortunately, unfortunately, it looks like for now, Israel has caved and they have suspended uh, raising this illegal village uh, located strategically just off of Highway 1. It's a shame. It's a true shame that justice is not being served right now. Israel has to be strong and do what is necessary. And Israel's willing to give these people a wonderful life, but it's the Palestinian Authority holding them hostage. In other news here, a positive development, 
According to the J Post, the Ministerial Legislative Committee is supposed to debate a bill that would make it easier for Jews to purchase land in Area C of Judea and Samaria. The bill put forward by M.K. Betzal Smotrich, who has been among the leading legislators working to strengthen Jewish property rights in Judea and Samaria. Now, let's go back to the previous story. You may say, well, that's not fair. But the Arabs have areas A and B under the Palestinian Authority, area A totally under the PA, B municipally under the PA, where they can build whatever they want at will. And there's plenty of land to do so. But they're deliberately trying to build an Area C. So this bill actually counters uh, the previous story we were talking about, introduced by Bitsal Smotrich. His proposed legislation aims to change a 1953 law, get this, put in place when Jordan ruled the area prior to the Six-Day War that prevents non-Arabs from directly purchasing land. So why are we holding on to Jordanian law? I don't understand. This may be somebody out there with a legal mind can explain to me. I have no clue. Why would Israel win a defensive war of survival in 1967 and not implement our law into these areas? Why would we count on a 53 uh, Jordanian law? It boggles my mind. Uh, the bill would allow anyone to directly purchase land in Area C. The explanation for the bill, according to the J Post, states that it is unacceptable for Israeli citizens to be barred from buying land in Judea and Samaria because they are Israeli citizens. The bill makes complete sense to me. I hope it will be passed, making it easier for Jews to purchase land in Judea. It's kind of, it's somewhat ridiculous how that sounds that Jews cannot purchase land in Judea. It, it, it's completely mind boggling that that's the case. But till this day, since we're relying on some Jordanian law during their illegal occupation of this area, um, for some reason or another, that is, a, that is actually what's going on right now. Minister ascends the Temple Mount after three-year ban is lifted. Also by our good friend Gil Hoffman, our colleague here at the Land of Israel Network, reported today. Uh, member of Knesset and Minister of Agriculture Uri Ariel uh, ascended the Temple Mount on Sunday morning. This comes after a three-year ban on members of Knesset visiting the holy site. This is actually Ju Judaism's holiest site. Let's make that clear. After the ban was revoked by Prime Minister Netanyahu. The new policy allows members of Knesset to visit the Temple Mount once every three months and reverses previous legislation which forbade MKs from visitations for security reasons. So here's a positive development. MKs now allowed to go back to the Temple Mount. The Arabs, by the way, never listened to this ban. And there were plenty of Arab MKs during Ramadan who went up to the Temple Mount, even though it was illegal to do so. But now... Now that this has been lifted, um, the Jewish MKs can go up without fear of being arrested. I don't know why they didn't enforce the law when it, come, when it came to the Arabs, the Arab members of Knesset, yet they didn't. But hopefully now this is a shift in policy. Maybe someday there will be equal rights on the Temple Mount for Jews to pray as well, which actually is supposed to happen according to the law, but doesn't happen because the police overrule it and deem it too dangerous for Jews to pray on the Temple Mount, our holiest site. Hopefully this is a step in the right direction. The terror uh, continues from Gaza. The terror kites and balloons and whatnot reported by Israel National News over the weekend. At least 20 fires um, breaking out in different locations throughout southern Israel. I actually went down to the Gaza border on Friday to show support for the Golden family. Uh, the Golden family whose son was killed in the 2014 war down in Gaza. That was Hadar Golden, whose body is being held by Hamas ever since that 2014 uh, war. He actually was captured and killed during what was supposed to be a ceasefire. So the family invited the uh, citizens of the state of Israel to show their support for the family down in southern Israel, really to send a message to the prime minister and our leaders in Israel that they must take action in order to bring our boys back home, even if it's their bodies. Their bodies must be brought, brought home where they're being held by Hamas. Israel needs to do whatever it has to do in order to get the bodies back. So on Friday, there was a whole event down in uh, the Gaza border area where thousands of people gathered, Israelis gathered, and actually flew kites, uh, kites of peace, as opposed to the kites of hate and the firebomb kites and the incendiary kites, which are landing in Israel, as I just mentioned before, tw at least 20 fires breaking out over the weekend. We did the exact opposite down there to show support for the Golden family. 
and, um, and to send a message that thousands and thousands of residents of Israel are behind the family and that the government must do what is needed to be done, meaning pressure Hamas in any way, shape, or form in order to get our soldiers back. That's the least our government can do. And I stand with the Golden family in their protest in order to send that message and make it clear that our government must act to bring back all of our soldiers. And by the way, for the record, I am not talking about, and the family's not talking about, a prisoner exchange. That's not what this is. That's what not, not what this is at all. And finally for today, some positive news out of Israel. This reported by Israel 21C. Smartphone system for the blind wins first Silver Economy Award. An Israeli-made app and adhesive tags turn any smartphone into a fully accessible tactile device for people with vision impairment. That is the technology Israel is bringing to the world, always bringing something innovative, which helps so many populations. That's what Israel, the startup nation, does for the world. The Israel-based Project Ray, as reported by Israel 21C, was chosen best for profit organization at the inaugural European Silver Economy Awards ceremony held in Belgium. And um, Project Ray's app and adhesive tags turn any smartphone into a fully accessible device for people with vision impairment. Um, it was also named most promising Israeli startup at the Startup Nation Forum held by the Israeli Embassy as part of the 2018 VivaTech exhibition in Paris. So just more innovative, wonderful technology helping the visually impaired coming out of Israel. Israel, once again, leading the way to help so many different populations here in the world. That's going to do it for today. My name is Josh Haston. This is Israel Uncensored. The Land of Israel Network at thelandofisrael.com. My show for Monday, July the 9th. I'm actually recording here on Sunday, July the 8th. Um, the 26th of Tom was recording here on the 25th. Hope you're doing well in your part of the world. Get in touch with me during the week. Josh at thelandofisrael.com. Also on Facebook, Joshua Haston. On Twitter at Josh Haston. And most importantly, between now and when we talk again next week, please God, everyone out there in the wonderful world of ours, be safe. Shalom, shalom from Gush Etzion, Israel. All men dream, but not equally, says T.E. Lawrence. Those who dream by night in the dusty recesses of their minds wake in the day to find that it was vanity. But the dreamers of the day are dangerous men. They may act their dream with open eyes to make it possible. Now I'm trying to keep my eyes open and watch as my dream unfolds around me because I'm Rav Mike Foyer and this is The Jewish Story. Join Rav Mike Foyer for the best Jewish history podcast, The Jewish Story, on the Land of Israel Network 